My name is Andrea Pruchová Hruzová, and on behalf of the Fresh Eye platform for the study of visual cultures, I would like to welcome you at tonight's special program. This evening, we are going to have the pleasure and privilege to experience a lecture delivered by the political activist Huria Butelgia. The lecture called Why White Anti Fascism is Not Enough to Fight Islamophobia is a part of a two-day online program with the acronym WAVE, which means Workshops on Activism and Visuality in Europe. The WAVE project has been curated by Nicholas Mertsev and myself and offers an intensive learning and sharing experience to a group of 12 participants coming mostly from the region of Central and Eastern Europe. Workshops participants were chosen based on an open call and in the two days, yesterday and today, They've met interesting tutors whose creative practice revolves around the issue and the field of visual activism. Niklas Mertsev, Justinian Tribion, Bahar Behbahani, Alana Lentin, myself and Francesca Martinez Tagliavia. All workshops which our participants are experiencing live are recording for all of you and will be made available in upcoming days on two websites. First are the project website wave-workshops.org and the second are the website of the platform Fresh Eye, fresh eye.org slash CZ. I would like to thank also to three important local institutions which made this project happen through their financial support. Those are Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic, the Czech State Cultural Fund, and the Municipality of Prague. And I would also like to thank to my dear colleagues who put a lot of effort and time into this project as well. Those are Pavla Rouskova, Michal Svatý, David Trávníček, Tomáš Hlava, and Anna Dorniáková. And to all of you who are watching us today, thank you so much for joining us. I would just uh, like to remind you that you have an opportunity to ask your questions via the YouTube chat. So once the lecture will be done, there is a Q&A session following. So just enjoy this opportunity and comment uh, and question uh, what was said. And at this moment, it's my, uh, it's my privilege also to welcome here uh, a moderator of tonight's program who is a uh, leading visual critic, visual activist, and important figure of contemporary decolonial movement. It's Nicholas Mertsev. Thank you, Nick, for being the moderator of tonight's program. And thank you for helping so enormously with making this WAVE project and program happen. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and I think thank to everybody who you called out and mentioned uh, for what has obviously been a, a remarkable program. And it's inspiring to hear the Czech uh, authorities being willing to sponsor an event of this kind. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing uh, what comes of it. But before that, uh, we had the great pleasure of hearing tonight's keynote lecture from Uria Butelja. Um, and it's my honor and privilege to introduce her to you today. Uh, one of the most remarkable writers and activists uh, at work today, in my view. Uh, Uria Batelja is a French Algerian political activist and writer. And she's the author of, in 2012, Nous sommes les indigènes de la République. Uh, we are the indigenous of the Republic. And uh, that name uh, has also come to be the name of a political party, the Parti des Indigènes de la République, uh, for which Huria was uh, previously a spokesperson. Her best known work in English is this, this remarkable book, uh, which is, let me turn it the right way so you can actually see the cover, um, which is called We uh, Whites, Jews and Us, Towards a Politics of Revolutionary Love. Uh, it was translated in 2017, and it might be appropriate to notice that it came out in the semiotext series, uh, of whom the leading editor, Sylvain L'Etranger, uh, sadly uh, passed just a couple of weeks ago. And this book, I think, is indicative of the kind of remarkable contribution that the semiotext series made in bringing francophone writing to our attention, those of us who uh, live in the Anglophone world. This is a truly remarkable text. It is as if 
Fanon was still among us, but had somehow become feminist and uh, fully aware of, of the politics of intersectional and decolonial feminism at the same time. It is a kind of book that you can give anyone to read uh, and it will provoke remarkable uh, range of reactions. So I hope that while we're listening to the talk, if, you, if you've not yet had the opportunity to, to buy this book, that you'll take advantage of being online to, to get yourself a copy immediately. She, in the text, Butelja addresses herself to, to Jews, to whites, to, to women, to the people, and speaks from the point of view of us, the indigenous, uh, which is, of course, not my us. And she speaks to us in the way of in the way in which Descartes and French philosophy claim an I. And I just want to read you a little passage, just to give you a sense of what we're about to experience. He says, it is this I that will from now on occupy the center. I think therefore I am the one who decides. I think therefore I am the one who dominates. I think therefore I am the one who subjugates, pillages, steals, rapes commits genocide. It is now my enormous privilege and pleasure to welcome Udia Patelja to speak to us this evening uh, and there will be an opportunity for comments and questions afterwards and I'm sure that we'll, many of us will want to participate in that. Welcome Udia, bienvenue uh, to, this, uh, to this meeting and uh, we, are, we are enormously privileged and honoured to have you amongst us tonight. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Nicola, for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here and uh, to, to make this speech. Uh, and I'm going to, to, to begin. I just want to apologize for my English, which is not very, very, very fluent and not very, very good. So I'm going to read my my speech in English, and uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to, to ask. And hi, everyone. To, I just want, yes. So the, um, the, 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 the title of my, of my talk is Why White Antifascism is Not Enough to Fight Islamophobia. Uh, by way of introduction, I would like to start by saying that the situation in France and in Europe is quite worrisome. The economic crisis magnifying the situation we observe across the continent, the problematic rise of far-right, fascist and neo-Nazi forces. These radical nationalisms are increasingly inhibited. Some of them take part democratically in different elections and quietly become institutionalized. The National Front in, is the third political power in France, and it, uh, or even the second one, and its president is a woman who, who is uh, with a steel grip who doesn't hide her ambitions for the country's presidency. To reach this objective, she will stop at nothing to make her party appear respectable, and she's admirably successful. Admittedly, her task is facilitated by a number of circumstances. For instance, Islamophobia, and more, exact, and more exactly, a state-supported anti-Muslim type of racism is a national sport in France. The white political field that goes from the extreme right to the extreme left is completely contaminated. However, we must be precise in our analysis. Let me unpack some of this. My presentation uh, will be divided in two parts. The first one is the analysis of white antifascism and its complicity with institutional racism. The second part will focus on what we should do as post-colonial subjects or racialized subjects in France. So, Let's begin with my first part, far-right and anti-fascist complicity. Institutional Islamophobia is not a product of the extreme right. It is a product of social democracy represented first and foremost by the institutional left. And in French is the Socialist Party and the Republican right. One of the intellectual 
symbols of this social democracy is Alain Finkielkraut. I don't know if you know him, but is a philosopher who was recently admitted to the French Academy. In fact, we can interpret his nomination as a award given to him by the country for his services. He is indeed a very well-known Islamophobe, one of the worst neoconservatives of the past decade. And he is also a notorious Zionist. France knows how to recognize its great man. Finkelkraut, who was elected to take the seat of Félicien Marceau, had to deliver a speech in praise of Marceau. Marceau, who was a former member of this academy. One has to know that Marceau became famous for his anti-Semitic and pro-Nazi activities. This is the man who was replaced by Alain Finkielkraut, who is now a famous Islamophobe and a Zionist, who, but whose Jewish family was a victim of the Nazis. It is thus under the administration of the Republican right that the Islamophobic law of 2004 was adopted with the support of the institutional left. Also note that the left of the left, which is sometimes institutionalized uh, in France, for example, I'm talking about the Communist Party and sometimes not, and which is clearly anti-clerical, colonial and Eurocentric, participated extensively to the Islamophobic climate and by and, and large supported the 2004 law. Sometimes when I did not open, when it didn't, so, sorry, sometimes when it didn't openly support it, it didn't fight it either. And the few exceptions to this, to this confirm the rule. In addition, apart from a small minority, which includes anti-fascists and libertarians who fought really Islamophobia, a large part of the most radical and most anti-fascist fringe of the French left continues to, su to suspect Muslims and veiled women and continues to repeat the mantra, neither God nor master. This old slogan may have been relevant in the past when the church was in power, but is completely ridiculous today when we know that Islam is not a state-sponsored religion and is rather the religion of the new proletariats, the subordinate classes and the poorest of the poor, who anti-fascists claim to defend. Several years ago, far-right groups took part in a series of aggressions against veiled women in the suburbs of Paris, and this resulted in very few reactions. Only women were targeted. Anti-fascists didn't react much and neither did the feminists, if we exclude a small minority of them. I would like here to offer some explanations to better understand why this is so. And I would like to give uh, three explanations. The first explanation, most anti-fascists do not consider anti-racism as a political, but as a moral struggle. Thus, they do not understand the idea that anti-racism is a fight against an, inst an institutional type of oppression and not against the individual feeling of feelings of malicious individuals. Anti-racism includes anti-colonial resistance, the struggle against apartheid, in South Africa and racial segregation in the United States. Most anti-fascists do not understand such unity. To be fair, there is an evolution since the development of what we call political anti-racism, which is a movement that is led by people like us, and also since the death of George Floyd in the US. This is for the first explanation. The, the, the second one, most anti-fascists do not understand the notion that post-colonial populations' decolonial struggles are a major component of the fight against fascism. Such populations should be treated as equals and not as a protected species, which they own with their own agenda and priorities. The third explanation, 
most anti-fascists do not understand the idea that Muslims are victims and that Islam is a dominated religion, both within Western liberal democracies and outside of them in the context of imperialist relations. Rather, they see the sign of fascism in expressions of conservatism and religious dogmatism. These are shortcuts, but, these, but they are effective. These were my three explanations to understand the, why anti-fascists are not uh, fighting Islamophobia. The result of this state of affairs is that there is no spontaneous solidarity between white anti-fascism and non-white anti-racism. Sometimes they are in conflict with, with each other. In the past, in fact, there has been collusion between anti-fascism and imperialist forces against those struggling for independence. Here are three famous infamous examples in history, and I would like to stress them because they are very important. The first one is, in 1973 in France, the Popular Front, which emerged from anti-fascist movements but became a powerful popular movement representing the working classes, dissolved the North African star in France, in France, in France, l'étoile nord-africaine. Uh, an organization who fought for the national independence of Algeria and against the indigenous code, a set of laws creating an inferior legal status for natives of French colonies. The motive was that the North African star had dealings with the fascists. The truth is that on the colonial questions, the Popular Front was barely reformist and not at all revolutionary. Let us remember the Bloom Violet Bill, who promised to give the right to vote to 20,000 20, indigenous people, but which was not even endorsed by the Senate. As for the indigenous code, it was left untouched. Although also anti-fascists, do not claim being part of that experience, the Popular Front remains an example of a from-above type of anti-fascism. It is crucial to set the historical record of this type of anti-fascism in order to break with its reformist and therefore colonial component. As the Algerian nationalist politician Messali Hej had warned, he said, under quote, a popular front government will have to abandon the privileged race policy which has up to now inspired the entire legislation and administrative organization of the colonies. It was under bracket, it was a, a quote. The second uh, historical example, uh, uh, a second example of misunderstanding between anti-fascists and anti-colonialists is that European anti-fascists helped the war helped the war effort against Nazi Germany in collaboration with their respective states. Many anti-colonialists from the Maghreb and from Africa, more generally, have refused to participate in the liberation from the Nazis because they didn't understand why they had to restore democratic imperialisms. The, sec the third historical example comes from 1963 to 1993, at the time of the Popular Front in Spain this time, that government's hostility toward Moroccan nationalist claims, uh, sorry, that government's hostility to towards Moroccan nationalist claims was such that Moroccans, in return, showed indifference, indifference to Spain's misfortunes when confronted to the Franco coup. Some Moroccans went so far as to fight alongside Franco's troops. The arrival of the Popular Front didn't bring significant changes in the Spanish colonial policy. In addition, this government ended up depriving itself of a rare support, the Moroccan people, 
who could have changes the game with regards to Francoism. Here, we see that the class interests of the proletariats and European anti-fascists didn't correspond to the interests of the wretched of the world. It is possible to overcome these contradictions because it is obvious for me that fascism is the enemy of post-colonial people, Muslims, as well as the white and non-white working classes. For this to happen, it is necessary to render coherent anti-fascism and anti-colonialism, anti-fascism and anti-racism. But all this will remain theoretical if anti-fascism is not decolonized. It is urgent for anti-fascists to update, that is to say, to face their whiteness. Indeed, as long as they focus all their energy against the ultra-right, the far right, they will neglect two priorities, two priority issues. The first one is the transformation of the left, and the second one is the alliances with those who will be who bear the brunt of racism and are the preferred targets of fascism. Worse, they will be complicit in fascism if they claim otherwise, if they claim otherwise from their radical facade. However, if we tell them today you will have to consider alliances with birded men, veiled women, and maybe even with mosques, they will have a heart attack. We are obviously very aware of this. This is why I think that alliances are built under pressure and within power relationships. This means that we must create our own political existence and imagine, invent our allies. As the great Algerian sociologist Abdel Malik Sayed has said, to exist is to exist politically. So I jump now to my second part. Uh, the first one, if you remember, was uh, far right and anti-fascist complicity. Now the second one uh, is decolonial res resistance. I'm just asking a question because I have a problem with my computer. I'm coming. I'm here, sorry. No uh, I'm here. <laughs> it's it's okay with my computer. Don't don't worry. So uh, the second part is uh, decolonial resistance. Uh, it's a part when I want to 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 stress how to confront politically all this. Uh, as uh, Franz Franz Fanon taught us, a society is either racist or is not. And since only the truth is revolutionary, I will try to tell the truth. Indeed, since I belong, I'm talking about myself, since I belong to a racist society, and France is a, is a racist society, and I'm part of this whole, the racism that structures, and, that structures it infiltrates me. In fact, in my view, anyone who lives in a racist society but maintains that they are exempt of racism is at best fooling themselves or at worst lying. Racism is what we were fed since childhood, regardless of where we stand in the hierarchical scale of human dignity. If we stand at the high end of this hierarchy, we experience a more or less swollen sense of self. Our only ambition often is to preserve this dominant position. But if we are among those who endure racism, then we tend to feel a somewhat incurable hatred of ourselves. What subaltern groups yearn from the most is to cleanse themselves of, this, of the indignity in which they are placed and to elevate themselves 
on the ladder of the said hierarchy, even if it means trampling on those who are beneath them. For example, at a recent Muslim meeting in France, the title of one panel discussion about refugees was, was must we welcome all the misery of the world? This question was first asked by Michel Rocard, a famous prime minister of France, and often by Jean-Marie Le Pen, who, who is from, who uh, you know, is uh, the, the leader of the, the far right. Today, some in our own communities, I mean, among racialized people, we are asking this question. To me, the question is obscene, particularly when we are products of painful stories of exile, and particularly when we are not entirely innocent as European citizens of the wars France is waging in our name, and it must be said here, indirectly in our interest. In this respect, I would like us to reflect on the words of James Baldwin, who, seeing the destructive effects of racism on black people, wondered about the fate by asking, what will happen to all that beauty? What will happen to all that beauty? This is the question. This was the question of James, James Baldwin. Lucidity is surely the wound that is closest to the sun, and Baldwin's lucidity burns because facing oneself is not an easy task. Yes, it is mandatory for those who truly want to an end to racism. I'm confessing, I'm confessing today, but I have already confessed in my book, White People, White Jews and Us Towards Politics of Revolutionary Love. In the chapter of the book, I fault Jewish people, Jewish as product of the history of antisemitism, who have somewhat tended to integrate into this society despite their revolutionary history. Here is what I wrote. The worst part for me is not here. After all, what you surrender is up to you to decide. The worst are my thoughts when my eyes meet a child wearing a kippah in the street. That fleeting instant when I stop to look at him, the worst is the disappearance of my indifference towards you, the possible prelude of my own internal ruin. It was a citation and I finished it. These are two ways of interpreting this passage. White left's way of interpreting it or Baldwin's, Baldwin's one. Needless to say, the prevailing mediocrity favored the former. The later, more challenging interpretation is gaining influence. It demands, like Aimé Césaire, like Aimé Césaire that we look for the small Hitler inside of us, and not only in the far right, precisely because racism is systematic. In other words, in a racist society, we must resist integration. We have to be conscious of our own deterioration, uh, our own gradual decline. In fact, we are not hoodlums. We are the ears of the immigration. Uh, I don't know if I if I pronounce uh, if I if the if the pronunciation is good in French is hérita, héritier in, in in French but in English H E I R S we are the hairs I don't know the I don't know sorry of the immigration struggles that preceded us and that shape France every day and with this heritage we observe the Gilets Jaunes movement, movement. I don't know if I have to, to explain what is the Gilets Jaunes movement. No? Right. It might be an idea just to, to, if you have time, just, just, just to, to, maybe some people are not familiar. That would be Yes, kind. it was, it, it was a, 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 a movement um, in France that took place two or three years uh, before, and it was uh, riots from the subaltern classes, but white subaltern classes. It was a big, it was, it was a, 
a, a big movement and 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 quite violent. It was against the state, against the the fact that uh, uh, life is is becoming very expensive for for subaltern people. So, the le, 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 le movement des gilets jaunes. So, and so and with this heritage, we observe the gilets jaunes movement. With our long experience in struggles, we carry a message to the social movement that is being violently clubbed today by the police and the French government. The French intellectuals and the Gilets Jaunes movement do not understand the absence, the absence of non-white people, it means Africans and Muslim people. Criticism, uh, uh, under bracket, criticism, criticisms noted the absence of people from the poor neighborhoods especially immigrants or post-colonial minorities. Then uh, they, they, went, uh, they went to on to affirm, to affirm that if a successful articulation takes place with labor movements and civil society networks of these neighborhoods, nothing would be, would be able to stop this movement. Frédéric Lourdon, who is a French leftist and very interesting intellectual, one of the most white radical intellectuals gave an important speech in which he stressed that the current social movement must face two plagues, the violence of capitalism and racist identitarian violence. Well, we are on the same page, but what must be done for this accurate observation to become effective and not remain confined to the real or of abstract incantation. So what should we do? Let's imagine that there are two dis dis distinct power logics in our society. The capitalist one is based on generating as much money as possible. And the geopolitical one is based on accumulating geopolitical power by imposing order on a national territory and building military industrial and commercial power against other nations. Two forms of ri um, rivalries emerge here, strictly economic rivalries, competition between private enterprises, and military political diplomatic ones, competition between nation and superpowers. We can also say that the spread of modern imperialism is a result of these two logics working hand in hand, capitalism, uh, capitalist finance, state policies, public loans, weapons, industries, enterprises of colonial exploitation. In return, states use the power to advance the interests of their national business sectors, the workforce that was co coerced into slavery through the slave trade, forced labor in the colonies, the destructions the destructuring of agricultural communities in the third world, oil as a key motive for invading Iraq and Afghanistan to ensure that it remains outside the control of the region's people. Broadly speaking, capitalism is born out of the power politics of nation states and nation states gained power with the help of modern capitalism. Now consider that one of the pillars of these geopolitical logics of power is race. I said this because on the global scale, a hierarchy separates the world into dominant rival nations and dominated ones, which have become the hunting grounds of the dominant nations. The stakes here are crucial. Race is the note of alliance between the modern state and big business capital. Capital, Capitalists value creation and nation states political power are tied together by race. In this way, state personnel, high ranking officials, chiefs of police, military staff meet capital through race. By following its national racial internal logic, the state serves the interests of capitalists. It does, it does so by pursuing an imperial policy, continuing to advance national economic interests, 
through diplomatic, trade or military agreements. This is what France does with its weapon industries and its big industrial group specialized in aeronautics and nuclear power or through what we call the France Afrique, the relation, the relation between France, the, the colonial relation between France and its former colonies in Africa, which we call it la France Afrique. This official instances advanced the interest of only a few big emblemat uh, emblematic groups such as Dassault, UADS, etc., etc. Also on national soil, there is a real colonial continuity of the nation state. This is materially apparent with the state apparatus, the history of its police, its intelligence services, its ideological and media systems, its schools, etc., etc. These administrations more or less enforce a, logic, a logical separation of the population into two groups, the white people and the others. This separ separation logic is an integral part of the modern nation state. As brilliantly demonstrated by Abdel Malek Sayyad, who is a very a fa an Algerian famous sociologic, uh, sociologist, and Etienne Balibar, that you probably know, the nation inevitably produces foreigners. Human rights universalism has always had exceptions and nations led predatory policies in the global south. So by reproducing race, state personnel reinforce the hierarchies that big business capital, capital exploits. Descendants of the colonized are also the last to be hired and the first to be fired. This system provides a reserve army of cheap labor. This brings us to the last point. The reason this labor force is easier to exploit is that the nation state's racial logic tends to offer more economic, econ economic protection to the white working class than it offers non-white workers. This also meant that white labor movements were more prone to abide by Republican legality, to trust the, state, the, the state's neutrality. At best, it sees the welfare state at the good side of the state, as opposed to the bad authoritarian, securitarian side. But to non-white people, even the good side of the state is a way to keep them in their place. Social workers, unemployment agencies, child protection, physical and mental health personnel all take part to a certain extent in social control. We can come to the conclusion that the racial logic strengthens apathy and inertia within the social movement. Since white supremacy is the knot that ties capital to the state, untangling this knot among the oppressed would enable more radical ra rallying cries. Opposing to capital should also translate into opposition, sorry, opposition to capital should also translate into opposition to the state. It just so happens that for more than 40 years, post-colonial struggles, if you follow the history, have been at the forefront of the confrontation with the national and imperial state and its mythology. Committees, examples, committees dealing with police violence and judicial and prison systems, resistance to the demolition of Roma camps, struggles against state racism, for Palestine, for the end of the France Afrique, and for the memories of colonization and the slave trade, all of these call into question the ideological base of the Republican mythology. I would also say that if the social movement has really political ambitions, it is up to that movement to help move its center of gravity, which is now found in the work law, who, whose stakes were, we, we certainly understand, towards questions of imperialism and racism and their terrible 
consequences in France. I think that this, this is the condition of a good alliance between uh, white working class and non-white working class to fight uh, racism. This is it. Thank you for your for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, really rich presentation. And I know from personal experience, it, it's difficult doing it in your second or third language in your case, I imagine. Um, so we're, we're grateful for, to you for that. And I felt that as always, your work challenges us to rise to a, a, a broader vision of the struggle. And I just wanted to set it into a context. I'm here in New York right now. And yesterday, while I was speaking to this same group of people that you've just addressed, we had this court decision uh, that you may have heard about, where a young man called Kyle Rittenhouse had killed several anti-racist protesters using uh, an automatic rifle and was acquitted of all charges yesterday. Uh, he, not only did he not kill them, he didn't harm them, and he committed no offense in the eyes of a white jury. So we have here in this country at the moment uh, a very visible on the street white supremacist armed and insurrectionist movement. And I think it's important for everyone to understand how thin the line is at the moment between where we are now and an overtly fascist regime that is very likely to, to come back into power. And I felt that in your presentation where you talk richly about the way that the logic of race depresses our movements and fails to prevent them coming together, I thought that was a resonant, resonant part of your presentation. And I just wanted to to take my privilege as the chair to ask the first question to you. And I wanted to make, I saw many parallels obviously between what's happening in France and Western Europe and what's happening in North America right now. And I wanted to ask you just a little bit if we could maybe draw on some of that in the sense that one of the main focuses here has been the removal of the racist symbolic order, statues and other memorials, and the attempt to uh, repatriate cultural property. And I'm struck by the way that in France, you have Macron, who is saying, well, I, yes, I'm going to send things back to Benin, and uh, only 26, but nonetheless, are beginnings there. At the same time as you have this very wide ranging racist movement that you've described and it seems as as with many things in france it seems a contradiction to those of us outside we feel like how are these two things happening at the same time is it just not how is it perceived this return of cultural property um does it not require in some way an understanding of colonialism and racism in order to understand why these things must be returned or are they being returned as a kind of gift from the empire uh, to to it, the formerly colonized? How do you understand what's going on with that? I think I think this is I think that th this is um, a compromise. Uh, of course, it it seems it 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 seems to be a contradiction, but actually this is a compromise because there is a relation of, of power in in. Uh, in the political field, because uh, there is a resistance, there is uh, France is crit uh, is uh, criticized everywhere in the world. France is crit is criticized in Africa, but France is also challenged in Africa. Uh, two or three decades before, she was the only imperialist power in in the former colonies of of Africa. Now there is China. Now there is our uh, other other uh, other powers uh, uh, who wants to challenge 
the, the power of France in, in Africa, not for the interest of the Africans, but France is not alone anymore. So I think that uh, this is the expression of a, of, a, of a decline. I think that France has to do a, has to do compromises, but they are only symbolic. Sure. They are only symbolic. Sure. It's not uh, it's not a question of of, of big money. <laughs> Never. It's not no, a I question. Of, you understand? This is symbolic. She 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 she's okay. France is okay to do symbolic things. Okay. She, 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 she can uh, acknowledge a certain uh, uh, the, a part of the history. She can acknowledge that uh, colonialism was not so good, sometimes, but not always. <laughs> Understood. Do you think, I mean, what we would call here racial capital, you know, following Cedric Robinson, how do you feel that these quest questions of the, can be described as, what, what is the limit at, of the symbolic in understanding what racial capital is and what it does. You spoke very powerfully and I thought movingly about the challenge to the self, that all of us, whoever we may feel that we are, have a challenge you know, to, to work on our, ourselves in relation to others because we cannot be outside the racial regime. And uh, you, you wrote about that and you spoke about it today. And that then seems seems to me then that how do you, in your thinking, create, a, as it were, a map between the symbolic and the self and the individual and capital? Are they, I think of them in some ways as layers, that they are connected, you know? Um, but it sounds to me as if you're maybe saying that there's a separation that you want to describe between these different fields of racial capital. So I wonder how you, how you, as it were, map the relationship between the self and the symbol and capital. I'm, I'm not sure to understand the question. Uh, okay. How is, what is the link between the self? And what the, we, idea, the symbolic order that we were just talking about. The, yes, the, and, and the capital? And capital, yeah. What is the link between them? How do you see them? How do you see those things as being related to each other? What are the um, connections and the separations? I'm, I'm, I'm now, I, I don't know if, if I, I will uh, answer uh, your question uh, properly, but I, I, I will try. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm now write, writing a book about, uh, uh, on the basis of uh, um, a concept of Gradchi, who, who talked about uh l'état intégral the integral integral state i don't know if, if you know the concept mm -hmm. of gramsci l'état intégral mm -hmm. and i'm now thinking about uh focusing on on race on the basis of this um of this concept and i want to 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 to, to make uh to show that uh, uh i want to 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 think about the concept of uh, the, 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 the race integral, no, l'état racial integral. I don't know how to say it in, in English. L'état uh, racial integral. The rational integrative state, um, the, the state that integrates through the, the racial integral state. Right. The racial right. integral state. Uh, if we if you understand what uh, Gramsci said, he said that a state cannot survive cannot survive uh, without the complicity of what he called the political uh, society and the civilian society. Right. This is what he calls l'état intégral. It means that if we have a racist state it it means because there is a complicity there is a complicity of the bourgeoisie the political movements all of them and the people so i i hope i have i i i i answered your question but i think that 
if I am, if I live in a racist uh, country, and I'm, and I'm, and and there is racism inside of me, which I I assume, uh, homophobia, sexism, whatever, it's because this is this this is so structural, this is so structural, that we have to, first of all to think the role of the state. The role of the the integral state, not only the state. It's too easy to say la bourgeoisie is uh, guilty for racism. It's not it's not enough because I know that living in France, uh, I I am uh, uh, um, uh, in my relation to the white people in France. I'm not white, but. Yes. According to my citizenship and in relation to Africa, I am white because whiteness is a relation of power. Exactly. So it means that uh, I have a role in the reproduction of, of, uh, of racism, even if I'm not white. I'm not white. This is not the question. So we need to uh, create, to develop uh, a power, a political power, uh, which, is, which is against the integral race, uh, the race, <laughs> integral state. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Not only, the bourgeoisie, not only the whites, not only the whites. Understood. Understood. And I think that what you just said there about whiteness being a relation of power is a very profound and important statement. Um, I, I do have one more question for you, but I just want to remind listeners and viewers that you, if you post a, chat, a question into the chat, uh, we can forward it to Uri Abutelja here, so please do that. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad question. I always think that it's particularly um, if, if people are not familiar maybe with some of the uh, areas that Dr. Bujelda has outlined for us, uh, that maybe uh, she would be happy to amplify and, uh, and to discuss it. Um, so please uh, feel free to, to post some questions there. Uh, and I, was, I just wanted to finally, um, in, in my own thinking, just to to um, to think a little bit more about the question of Islamophobia and its relation to to these logics. And I thought uh, very powerful the way that you spoke about Islamophobia being produced from within the heart of, of social democracy. Uh, Finke Akau, uh, who is, has a long history of being complicit with Zionism and, and, and so on. And I wonder if you could just say a little more to those of us who are not following the day-to-day -day debates in France. Many of us are, well, somewhere between puzzled and appalled um, by the prominence of the far right and, and the extent to which Le Pen appears to now be dominating the political discourse so that Macron shadows her, as it were, sort of see how far he, how far to the right he can move, to somehow cut off her oxygen without seeming to realize that he will become her, or maybe has already become her. Um, and is it is it, how is how do we? If, is it your sense then that this Islamophobia has, as it were, collapsed the left, that they are unable to kind of articulate an alternative because? At the moment, being white is privileged so much that you would rather defend that than come into an alliance with, as you call them, the dispossessed of the of the earth. I think that um, uh, is, is the, the the rise of Islamophobia in France is due to the capitulation of the of, of the left. Uh, but but it's more complicated than than that. It's not only a capitulation; it's a complicity. Right. Uh, but this complicity is now uh, weakening the left. So now the white uh, the, the 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 labor the white labor classes are now are now more are more weak than than before. They lost, they, they lost their, their own power because of Islamophobia. They are not aware about that. But I think that all this capitulation is now, they have to pay now the, the price for that, for this capitulation, for, for this complicity. 
now because they uh, they, they supported uh, Islam laws against Muslims, uh, but now all these laws are now uh, 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 returned against against the the the, 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 the social movement. Mm. This is how. Uh, not, because 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 they they left they left the the, the French uh, institution they let they, they let them uh, uh, being more and more oppressive against the Muslims but now it's against everyone everybody right yeah and that, that seems a very important connection to make um, I thought that just uh, just thinking too about it's very interesting to hear you speak of Gramsci. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, when I was much younger and uh, Stuart Hall was beginning his analysis of the, the politics of culture in Britain. And that was very much motivated by his reading of, of Stuart Hall. And it's, a, the, the, uh, excuse me, of Gramsci. And there's an interesting historical moment at work here where that, and that period in the 1980s, European and North American and British Critical thought was supposed to be contaminated by French thinking, uh, <laughs> and now it seems to be the other way around. Yes, uh, there's this peculiar moment in which suddenly France is kind of one of the angles of the new French white nationalism. Yes, seems to be saying keep out these terrible American and uh, other Anglophone ideas that are so corrupt, and uh, it's it's really quite striking to see this historical swing. Do you see that as being part of this new nationalism? That, yes, yeah. definitely, definitely. You talked you talked about the uh, semiotext and uh, that the, uh, yeah. and uh, about the fact that uh, Silver Lautranger, yes, it, it's true. He, 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 he was dead uh, se several weeks ago. He was mm -hmm. a great man and introduced the French theory in in the US. <laughs> now, if he want if uh, if semiotext wants to to, uh, to to promote a French thinker, I think now it's impossible. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, with with some exceptions, present company very much included. Um, clearly, the clearly the uh, it can't all have disappeared in that sense. I mean, there must be the legacy of the. Of, I mean, you've spoken about about the history of the Algerian War, uh, and and written about that and. And it, it will be the 60th anniversary of Algerian independence quite shortly. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if how the resonance now of the of the, the the war of independence feels in the context of this intense debate over over whiteness and Islamophobia. Now, will do you, will there be a, a celebration? Do you think of of the independence movement and, and its association, will it perhaps create some historical resonance, or do you think France will simply try and ignore the whole thing? I think that um, Islamophobia is a product of the Algerian war. Uh -huh. I think this is a continuation of the Algerian war. Of course, uh, it, it is very clear for me. Uh, I just I, I just want to say something maybe important. I think that in the international scale, uh, uh, Negrophobia, uh, racism mm -hmm. against black people, is the most important in the world. I think the, that uh, I can I, we can say that Negrophobia is is everywhere in the world. It it is the the, the model the the come on dear, the, uh, the pattern of racism, but in France, it is there is negrophobia in France, of course. But I think that it's important to see the national realities of uh, racism. And if negrophobia is very important and structural in France, I think that the the the, the, the heart of racism is the racism against the Arabs in mm -hmm. France. It's important to, to, to understand that if in France uh, Islamophobia is the most mediatic racism, it's because it is focused on the group who is seen as Arabs. And 
I want to stress here that lots of black people from sub-Africa are Muslims in France, but they are not seen at all as Muslims. They are seen as blacks. But Arabs, even if they are not practicing Islam, they are seen as Muslims. It means that there is, a, 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 in, in the heart of, the, of uh, France racism, in the heart, there is uh, the racism against Arabs. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's true. It is linked to the fact that uh, the, 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 the independence of Algeria was, uh, was um, obtained by uh, a war and it was and the algerians won this war <laughs> and this is a trauma in france still this this is why i wrote in my book when i'm i'm talking to the whites do you think that um, uh, the defeat of the french state is also your defeat to the whites I know this is a defeat of the of the state, but is is it also your defeat? If you think that the independence of Algeria is your defeat, how can can we be? How can we live together? Because for me, it's a victory. Aye. Aye. The, the, there is here a note. This is something wrong. This is something which is we we, we can we cannot. Um, uh, belong to uh, to a, a community, to a society, in, to the same society. If my independence is your defeat, my right. liberty is your defeat. There's something wrong here. Very much so. Uh, and I mean, made made me realize when you said that that I mean, it, I'm thinking, well, that's a long time. But then, of course, this country, the Civil War, which finished in 1865. Is still provoking those same divides, in the sense that the Republican majority sees this, the victory in the Civil War as their defeat, and they have continued to try and transform it ever since. I see now we've got a couple of questions in the chat, um, and I have this question uh, from Andrea, uh, and she's asking, actually, if I can make this visible to you, but I'll read it for you. She says, thank you for your passionate talk. I would like to ask about the role of media infrastructure in maintaining hegemonic power. Specifically, I'm thinking about TV broadcasting and social media and the way how they communicate social hierarchy in France. Um, all, the, all the big... French media are, are Islamophobic, and uh, there is no discussion on that. And someone who uh, it, it means that if you are a Muslim, you have to to apologize for terrorism. You have to apologize for uh, the the, the so-called submission of women in Islam. You have always to apologize because you are guilty, and you have to show you are not. You, you have to show that you are you are you are ashamed about that so all the media are islamophobic but we have to understand a specific role of the media during the gilet jaune movement and it's very very important because white people are every day created for being islamophobic i'm not talking about the state i'm talking about what the, the state is doing to maintain a certain level of Islamophobia in France. But the problem is that when there was the movement of the Gilets Jaunes, I think that, as I told you, in a racist society, we are all racist. I think that this white category is racist. It is anti-Semitic, is homophobic, etc., etc. There's no doubt about that. But in their movement, Islamophobia was not in the center of their uh, of the of the head of the movement, they were struggling against the state about the fact that um, the the life is expensive, and about the the fact that uh, the state is um, is um, 
uh, méprisant. I don't know the word in, in English. Oh, okay. So it's not important. Um, and uh, and uh, and the, the movement was was very violent against the state. Very violent. And I think that the the upper classes and the state and la bourgeoisie understood understood uh, that there was here a big problem because they uh, they they did all what they can to separate subalterns classes the whites and the non-whites because what is uh, what is very uh, dangerous for them is the the, the the fact that we can all fight together okay and when they saw that uh, this movement was not as islamophobic as they hope uh, islamophobia become more and more aggressive in the media uh, the law uh, uh, which is called loi separatiste contre les séparatismes was voted after the gilet jaune movement uh. It was very, very important for the state and for la bourgeoisie to make this convergence completely impossible. Right. right. This is a kind of Pujadism, um, a kind of a violence against everything. The yes. Yes. I yes. wanted to ask you in relation to that, because I know that this is an important part of your work to think maybe just update just a little bit about how you feel the situation in Palestine is playing into this relation of Islamophobia and the state uh, in France. I mean, and, and, and I wanted to just wonder because the events in Palestine in 2020 undid some of the automatic support for Israel in some countries, I mean, in some parts of Western Europe and, and in the United States even, that there has been, for the first time in some places, the possibility to express some critique and criticism of the settler colonial regime in Palestine. I wonder how you see that from the perspective of France and France Afrique and the Francophonie. Um, is this, how is the the situation in Palestine being perceived in relation to what you've described to us? I think that the situation is, is quite different from the United States because I know that in, in the United States there is uh, more um, ideological resistance against, uh, against the propaganda on uh, Palestine. And I think that in there are a lot of positive things in the US uh, according to this question, but in France not at all, not at all. In France, uh, they want uh, Macron wants to uh, make uh, a law uh, to uh, criminalize anti-Zionism, for example, to say that to make an equivalence between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. They want to do that in the law. They want to 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 to, to make to 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 create this equivalence. And the, the situation is in France, uh, according to the Jewish community, is very complicated because uh, a lot of Jews in France are coming from North Africa. They are Arabs, but they don't want to be seen as Arabs because they, they were completely integrated. So they refuse, uh, they refuse to, to, to be considered as Arabs. So as all, all the people who want to be integrated, they are uh, more racist than the others. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, I'm of Jewish descent myself, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. I mean, yes. I, I, to, I think it's there's something about that word community that's often very dangerous in this context. It seems to me that, that it's clear that there is no root community because there's so many divisions and yes and tensions within it. And yet, as soon as you say the Jewish community, this or the, the white, or whatever it may be, suddenly, rhetorically, you're in a position of dominance that those of us who are kind of considered to be outside, we're not religious enough, or we don't perform Jewishness enough, don't count. 
uh, or in fact, we are told we are subject to something called self-hatred. Yes. Um, and, you know, the, that has always struck me as a strange formula because who is, what is it that is hating the self? You know, what, what mechanism are we imagining that hates the self if it isn't the self? Can the self hate itself? It doesn't make any logical sense, but like most of what you've been describing to us today, it is out, it, it's a sort of outside the frame of rational or, or argumentative thought and, and, it, and this kind of sea of connected emotions that once once you begin to allow them to appear seem very difficult to contest because how do you argue against an emotion? How do you tell somebody what you're feeling is wrong? Um, That's true. I wondered if you have any thoughts on that, because I know that you have dealt with this for many years. Uh, and how, how, how does one take that struggle on? What are the, what are the practical things that we might try and do? Um, it's very difficult <laughs> to answer. I think that uh, uh, what the first conscience we have we have to have <laughs> is to to liberate ourselves ourselves from uh, from whiteness i think that this is the first step if you don't if you if you want to belong to whiteness you are uh, you are defeated from the beginning do you know that in france the first challenger to marine le pen who is from the extreme right is a Jew from Algeria, Eric Zemmour. Yeah. He is more fascist than her. And he said, and he said uh, that uh, Pétain, you know Pétain? Pétain didn't, didn't kill Jews in, in, in France. He's the first one in France, only the far right can say that. And, but the, the extreme far right, uh, Marine Le Pen, who, who wants to, to, to go to the presidency, cannot say that. She can't say that in France. Right. It's impossible. But him, as a Jew, and as a candidate for the presidency, and he's very famous, he said, Pétain is not a problem for me. It's incredible. It's incredible. And the far right... Uh, is is so grateful for that. They're so happy to have a Jew who said that. And he and it's he incredible through the media. And if I'm thinking, if I'm right, am I not that he's, he has a television show, doesn't he? Ah, uh, he's always on the on the TV shows. Always, he's very Islamophobic, uh, but is also Judeophobic. Yes, of course. Yes, is cool. also judeophobic and what is and what is the difference between him and uh, Jews who are Zionists in France is that is is not he's not for Israel is not really Zionist why because he wants to become completely French completely white Completely, and is is not. Uh, we can we can say that is not very Zionist, and the Jews who are Zionists in France don't like him at all. Not because he's Islamophobic, but because he, he doesn't like Israel. <laughs> wow. This exactly. is this is crazy. <laughs> this is crazy, and I think that France is a laboratory of craziness. Wow. And this is why I think that when we are when we are indigenous, when we are Jew, when we are white, we have to escape whiteness. We have to escape whiteness. <laughs> this is this is it. Nothing else. Nothing else. That but is a, a, a right? development call, and I think uh, we've been—I've been grilling you for some time now, 
uh, and I know in your in your third language. And I think maybe that that note is where we should end. That the liberation of ourselves, wherever whatever our perspective personally might be, from whiteness is the message that we should take away from this uh, remarkable keynote that Uya Vatelje has offered us today uh, and in your work elsewhere. I want to thank you for everything that you do. And uh, we are grateful that you exist and that you would give us some sense of the, what is possible. And uh, even in, in moments where things, things are difficult, um, I think there was also opportunity. And it's an opportunity to start to to think as radically as you have asked us to think uh, by not taking anything for granted and really questioning some first principles, as is, I think, that is the function of, of critical thought and uh, it continues to be. So uh, I would like to draw this uh, meeting to a conclusion here uh, with all of our thanks to Uriya Vatalja, to Andrea and all the team at Fresh Eye for bringing this group of people together. Uh, and I think uh, all the materials will become available online. Uh, these meetings have been uh, recorded so people can go back over it and, and learn from the depth of what was offered to us today. So we thank you we, um, and uh, we wish you every success uh, in the work that you do. Uh, and we look forward to the new book. Uh, it sounds important. Thank you so much. And I hope to meet you one day. <laughs> one uh, well, it would have welcome. welcome. <laughs> Pandemics and everything else. Uh, and sorry. thank Absolutely. you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. Absolutely. And all of us. Thank you.